Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, hello everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Developer Experience Office Hours here on OpenShift TV. I am Chris Short, uh, Principal Technical Marketing Manager at Red Hat. I forgot what my job title was over the long weekend. Uh, it's shocking. Um, the, the the crew I'm joined by today is a group of wonderful developer advocates and, and people that are out in the field helping people teach others how to code in today's cloud native world and how to build things in our cloud native world today. But, you know, it, it's kind of an interesting week, you know, here in the U.S. We just had a major holiday. Uh, you know, a, a lot of people will be taking Friday off. Uh, so it's a shorter week. And um, we kind of wanted to have a little fun on the show today. So we're going to talk about our favorite stacks and maybe some of our not so favorite stacks. And when we say favorite, we mean like most productive or maybe not the best, but like the things that the folks on the channel appreciated the most. So let's do a round robin kind of intro, you know, for folks that are new on the program or haven't watched us before. Uh, Ryan, would you like to kick things off, please, since you're our regular regular? Sure, you bet. Uh, I'm Ryan Jarvanen. You could find me online as Ryan J, uh, developer advocate here on the OpenShift team. Um, and I will send things over. We got a couple of new folks uh, new to the to this stream today. Yes. Um, I'm going to hand it off to one of our other standby uh, folks, uh, Natali. Uh, Natali, you want to do an intro next? Yeah, hello, my name is Natale Vinto, Developer Advocate, same team of Ryan. Uh, you can follow me also on Twitter with Natale Vinto handle. And today I'm uh, here uh, we also with uh, our colleague uh, Madhu. Madhu, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes, yes. Hello, hello guys, hello everybody. So my name is Madhu Kulibadi. I'm based in France and I'm a specialist solution architect. So based so on uh, OpenShift and all the developer experience that uh, customer could have on OpenShift. And uh, basically, so I'm travel. So it's what I've do uh, before, but basically <laughs> I, I have a lot of meeting with customer in order to, under, to, to, to help them to understand all the benefit they could acquire by using and integrating uh, OpenShift in their development and application lifecycle. And I'm happy to be there. Awesome. And then last but not least, I think is Mr. Jason Dovies. Yeah. Hey, everyone. I'm on the same team with Natale and Ryan. I'm a developer advocate. I've uh, been on this channel a few times now. Um, you've probably seen me floating around at some point, and Chris just disappeared on me. There he is. Uh, Hi. And in terms of Twitter, He's most known <laughs> for this book, Kubernetes Operators. Which Very you can nice. download for free. I will drop a link in chat right now. If you don't get the link, let me know. Uh, but yes, you can get this operator's book written by Mr. Dobies and the one and only Josh Wood, uh, also on his team, their, their team. Um, but yes, please go download the book. And uh, Jason, sorry. I, uh... No, I, I don't have a copy near me. They're kind of about there. Um, so mm -hmm. I'm, I'm once again dropping the ball in the shameless self-promotion. So thank you for that. Yeah. So yeah, I got your shamelessness for you. Um, <laughs> all right. So who wants to start about like their, their favorite, most productive stack? I mean, Ryan, this is your idea. Do I'll, you want to just like randomly pick somebody I'll, or go first? I, I'm going to, I'm going to maybe I'll kick off. Uh, yeah. How about a little bit of both? I wanted to throw out a suggestion for folks in the audience, um, Please chime in in chat with uh, your feedback, your thoughts, uh, and your favorite uh, most productive uh, environments, um, especially if you're using Kubernetes uh, in your uh, development workflow today. Um, I think so. I'll, uh, I'll I'll throw it on over to uh, how about to Jay? Jay, do you have something to to share on this topic? Yeah, do you want to do the bad one? Should I do both, my good and my bad one? Do, do your good one first. And okay. like, yeah. accentuate start, the positive, start with right? A, start with a good, make sure the short doesn't go on for too long. I think we're trying to make sure we try to keep today positive. But yeah, otherwise, good. yeah. And it's fine because my bad is actually, um, would be fairly quick and it's all personal preference thing. So it's not even that negative. Absolutely. This is 100% your experiences, yeah. your, you know, your, your, so, your learned knowledge, right? Yeah. I'm the Python guy on our team, but not, uh, I say that, but it's not like I was pigeonholed into it. Um, I cut my teeth on Java in college and then spent 
God, like 10 years of my career doing Java. Um, uh, worked for JBoss and then Red Hat bought them and then I moved over to Red Hat Satellite, picked up Python and I just enjoy that most. Um, so I haven't put a ton of thought into this, so it's not going to be the most organized answer, but um, mm. I can tell you that, actually before I even get to that real quick, um, one thing I do want to give a shout out to in terms of, of, of stacks, and this isn't completely fair because I've never done a ground up project, but um, if you've ever installed any of the solid open source PHP applications, so like your WordPress, your PHP BB, Drupal, just like two weeks ago, things, yeah. yeah, I set up one of those for um, to do my own link shortener instead of Bitly. So I have my own DNS and I have my own link shortener mm -hmm. now. And it reminded me how awesome those are to work with, where I remember the first time I installed WordPress and they're like, just basically drop this in, enable PHP and go. Off and then the first right. time it boots up and it's like, hey, the first time you go to the page, it's like, hey, it looks like you want to do an install and then it guides you through and then you go and you set the, it sets the, the conf uh, PHP for you and it tells you to change permissions. And like, I've played with so many of them and that entire, I, I say PHP, I really feel like it's not exclusive to that world, obviously, but if you get into any of these big projects, they all have that similar feel of, unzip to your HTML directory, go to this page, and then the mm. install guide you through. And it is so slick every time. And like my first WordPress blog was going on 16, 17 years ago now. And at the time it was wow. really badass. But like, like I said, two weeks ago, I set up this URL shortener and I was like, God, I missed this whole process. I'm like, <laughs> anyways, I'm like, it's really slick and smooth. And like, you know, you don't, it, it was, it's weird. Cause like, you don't think of installing a web app per se. Um, you know, I do everything through DNF for um, my Linux desktop. I use Homebrew for my Mac. But like that prospect of this installation, this configuration, it's really slick. So um, very cool from a general PHP stack standpoint. Um, personally, though, I think I, these days I've been doing a lot with Flask, although I'm going to mention yeah. Django a little bit more here because um, the, the kind of... In, in particular, so I assume most of you guys haven't played with Django. It's your what you would expect out of any kind of web-based framework that supports uh, REST. I have played Django, Django admin is killer. I, I have played with Django is... because uh, Ansible Tower uses Django. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. I guess you would have from the Ansible background. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And what I what one of the cooler features of it is it gives you this managed script and you run everything through that. So Python manage and then you do something. Um, handles all of your database migrations, which is really, really awesome that I haven't had to think about it. Um, and it's, it, this is a neat topic for me. I almost wish I had realized that was, this was going to be the topic earlier because I teach um, at Villanova University and I teach senior projects this semester. And I've been spending the past two weeks prepping all these students who have never touched any of this stuff. And I'm like, all right, well, first thing you got to do is, is pick your stack. And they're like, well, I have no idea that I just like bombard them with options. So I was telling them about Django. And, you know, since this is an OpenShift and Kubernetes related um, uh, podcast, or not podcast, what are we on? This is a, what the hell is your Live stream. Stream? stream. Live we'll call stream. stream. Yeah. Um, sorry, I'm a little under caffeinated for this. Um, yeah, so what I think is particularly neat is that you can chain into that manage.py to automate things like the database upgrade. So I have an app that I was playing with where instead of having the image directly call the Python manage, I have a basic shell script that will run through the database upgrade and migrations first and then start the server. So it gives me that single container that's going to do everything. Um, it also has a little bit in there where I can just try to upgrade the database. And if it's not there, it'll wait a little bit and try again. So that from an integration standpoint has been neat that you have this script outside the project level um, utility that does everything you need to do in terms of generating the migrations, running them, running the server, mm -hmm. and then being able to call that from the container. Another option is I could have packaged that as an init container and then just have that run the migration script. So all that flexibility was really slick. Um, and I just like, you know, I, I, this isn't supposed to be a selling thing for Django, so I could just talk about how nerdy I get. Like, I still, to this day, it is 2020, and when I see an ORM framework work correctly and, like, mm. easily, I still, it's one of those things that still, like, makes me excited. And I was trying to tell my students this. I was like, you're, like, it's cool you took databases. 
if you use that, if I see you writing SQL, you've probably done something wrong right. because none of your projects are complex enough to need you to go to that level. So yeah. make your objects, poof, they just magically appear in the database. Like that's one of those little things that still kind of makes me excited to be in this industry. Even it's something as simple as SSHing into a box across the planet, like in Singapore or an AP Southeast or something like that. I'm like, damn, that is so wild. Like, and I'm off topic now. But like, it's one of those like things that I'm like, this is still really cool to me. Like 20 years into yeah. my career, this stuff still, you sit back and like, that is really badass. And, and ORM frameworks and, and Django has this kind of support for it. Um, I'll, I'll talk about Flask real quick. I'm starting to get it, realize that there's not really a single paradigm for using Flask which I kind of dig. Like you'll see if you follow Absolutely. a tutorial, depending on who you get, people will approach it in wildly different ways, um, which is an interesting take on it. And it lets you kind of shimmy things around based on when you need to load your database and when you need to, a lot of these are designed expecting you throw some database credentials to the framework, it's gonna start up and immediately connect to the database. And in cloud native, that's not necessarily the case, right? We have. If, unless you have some specific install plan that starts your database container and waits for it to be running before starting your application, you got to understand those timing issues and have it try to reconnect and be a little bit more smart. So um, I think being able to play around with the kind of openness of Flask and to be able to support that is really cool. Um, so I feel like I've been talking for a while. I'm going to shut up on that now, though I suspect I'm going to jump back in and, and comment on all the other topics. Ah, you're fine, Ryan. Where are we going next? Yeah, I, I like uh, I like the um, sentiments you had there. I think one thing that I've I've been developing for a long time, so I've seen a lot of kind of transitions through different uh, fads and different um, trends in computing. And I know uh, Lamp Stack is something that is like a big reference frame in my mind uh you know that was the the paradigm for like years and years whether the p was uh php or python you can debate but um yeah, yeah. lamp lamp stack uh definitely is something that's good to know but it uh originally was a lot of a lot of kind of like you'd set up your own MySQL, you'd hope that it was the right version of MySQL and that you were using, you know, you'd probably be locked into a certain Linux distribution because you wanted to make sure you were on that MySQL and, and with those patches. And, uh, you know, there's a, a lot of variability to it, especially when you have individual developers choosing their own um, workstation environments and then promoting things from maybe a Fedora up to an Ubuntu, or, you know, like you have weird uh, issues with binaries and dependencies that are hard to keep track of. Um, I think one of my most productive environments um, was possibly, I really like Django admin um, for developing something that I could hand off to um, teams that needed like a strong admin interface to interact with the database. Um, but Ruby on Rails was probably my fastest uh, point for being able to slam out new web services in, in a short amount of time. Uh, anyone else here on the chat uh, used Ruby in the past? So I have, uh, you know, I'm an ops guy, you know, traditionally background. So pretty much all the languages oh. you're talking about, I've touched before. So like, yes, Ruby on Rails, I've had a lot of experience with Ruby on Rails shops and they tend to be highly productive, uh, which is really cool to see. That was one of my first full-blown MVC frameworks that did everything for me when it, it's got everything supporting the unit testing and the database connections. And now we're, we're looking back. Migrations. Later, migrations. Yeah. All nine yards, yeah. And that was yeah. one of the first ones I personally played with. I don't know enough about the history to say when, but I know that I feel like that was one of the beginning ones. Like there was struts on Java and that kind of stuff, but Rails was the first one that felt like it was absolutely everything. And I mean, you, you say Ruby on Rails. Like I often have to like tell my students, like, no, no, Ruby's a language on Rails is really the way you use it. <laughs> Yeah, but it's two different things, but that's the phrase. That's what everybody talks about. It's just Ruby on Rails. That's that's how you do it. Right. Like people, like, yeah, like Ruby and Ruby on Rails, like it's almost like Kleenex and Xerox, right? Like they're almost synonymous now, right? Like it's just the way. Um, 
there's other ways to do Ruby, but it feels like Ruby on Rails has become the default. That way, yeah, yeah, that's a very uh, common way of leveraging Ruby. I think from Chris's end, the more systems end, you're probably just using pure Ruby. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, uh, I don't know. That was definitely probably one of my high points for productivity. And uh, to quickly contrast it, I did a kind of a typical lamp stack um, at the job I had following right after the Ruby on Rails job. I went to a job where I was more uh, traditional LAMP um, and uh, PHP, MySQL. Um, that was a big MySQL database on, on that next job. Uh, we were really pushing MySQL to the absolute limits of, of what it could do um, at, at that point in time. Um, and so when I was developing as a standard front-end developer, um, I definitely wouldn't have access to the production database. Right. I'd be developing based on kind of a replica stack that didn't fully represent what was available in production. Um, and one of the main differences was um, my dev stack did not have memcache and uh, production always did. And I'd have, there was no clear tool for clearing the cache or deleting bad cache records. And so that was a, a lot of our day job was like figuring out what was wrong with the cache and how we can work around it instead of using the cache. And it was like really kind of fighting the stack in a lot of ways. Um, and uh, our deployment tool at that job was just doing a SVN export um, right onto some production disks. And uh, it was not always reliable. Um, that is it, so uh, cliche. I learned a lot. <laughs> like that's straight out of like a, a textbook horror story of all of the issues wrong with why DevOps actually became popular. Right. Exactly. <laughs> we were doing, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, we were doing, we were doing some really advanced stuff at that. Like I was doing an SVN export onto production disks, um, but uh, that would all be in a separate folder um, behind. And then in order to uh, pop forward to that deployment, we'd point, repoint a sim link. Um, so it was a really quick atomic operation and something that could always be rolled back by repointing the sim link. Um, and then we also did traffic shaping using like cookies and stuff. So we were basically like we could have used Istio maybe if we mm -hmm. were if we had all the technology um, that's maybe what I would do today to re-implement that same stack in a sane way. Um, but I don't know enough about Istio to, to plug it all, you know, to do it to that level. But interesting. Um, I learned a lot. I learned, you know, um, that was where I learned how to do traffic diversion and have multiple versions in, in production at the same time and code in production and don't worry about deploying on Fridays because I don't know. Um, yeah, I learned a lot yeah. at that job. It wasn't easy though. No, I bet. Jeez. Yeah. <laughs> uh, anyone else have a similar uh, transitionary story from LAMP to uh, more more modern development that they'd like to review? Natali? Mm. Oh, not from LAMP, actually, um, also, you know, from a university, um, you know, studies, you, you become a, usually uh, used to become a Java developer. So I was a Java engineer. I started, uh, uh, yeah, I, I started working as a Java uh, engineer, working moreover, you know, on application content. At that time, there was the difference between application containers. There were uh, JBoss like Wildfly or, uh, or Glassfish. And we were working also with Tomcat that was an application server. And to be honest, working in an application container with the AJB version three was pretty, pretty easy for us. We were using yeah. uh, uh, Ibernate, still in use Ibernate for generating the entity mapping. So, uh, you know, a tool that generates the maps, the, the table on the database, uh, execute also uh, the migration of the database. Jay was mentioning this uh, about the database. It's really important that you have a tool that help you uh, running this migration because your software change as your that, uh, scheme or database change. 
this is not true maybe with uh, no sequels but you have to figure out also uh, how to uh, create your even your schema less uh, from from the code right so my um, I, I was born with this model java enterprise application container and to be honest was very easy to work as a backend engineer in this way even for using jsp maybe for the front end but as backend was very easy to do this um, and you said you were using ejbs uh, not now i was using agb AJ, agbs yeah yeah, yeah. agb oh, wow. okay EJ, wow. sorry, EJB. Sorry. Yeah, EJ, okay, okay, got it. Yeah, 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 enterprise. Enterprise. yeah, 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 enterprise. Um, yeah, enterprise beans. That's interesting that you had such a good experience with it because like I never, I didn't do a ton and I thought that, and I don't know how far back you're talking, but the, the general sentiment at that time was it was fairly rough to get the build process set up, but could be totally my experience. This is why these kind of talks are cool. Um, and that's interesting to hear that that actually worked really well for you. That's awesome. Yeah, um, it was it was working good. Uh, um, starting with those uh, the glassfish wildfly, uh, then turned it in JBoss. Um, I think uh, today backends uh, developed in Java are mostly on those technology. Yeah, but maybe Madhu can share something about the new yeah. technologies in Java. Madhu, how do we do Java in a cloud native way? You know, right? Like, so yes, uh, basically on the cloud native way. So let's start from the beginning. So as uh, Natalie, when I finished my study, so everything was mostly focused on Java as a Java developer, and yes, on the market, basically everybody were looking for Java developers. It was quite easy to find some jobs like this. So uh, I use Java in uh, uh, so using Java with different framework and also with different uh, application servers. So I start. Uh, so I think my first project was migrating from WebSphere to WebLogic. So basically, with all the Java stack that you have to migrate, etc. So now that I'm Red Hat, we try to migrate this both our technology using um, JBoss EAP. But uh, yes, mainly on my, let's say, career. So let's say my favorite one and my uh, more productive one is Java. But uh, it's because I'm really comfortable with that. And uh, I mean, for sure, if you try to make me some competition, so Java against uh, Ruby, for example, or for Python. So I think we can have a really, really cool uh, competition on that. Uh, on the mm. Clone Native way, Right now, uh, on the cloud native way, uh, mainly uh, what I've seen so on the market and uh, I and what I start, it's uh, I start with uh, Spring Boot, okay, right on the cloud native way because it's microservices. Everybody doing Spring Boot is very very easy. So just the difference between when you want to deploy something with the application, create a, a REST API, et cetera, et cetera. So basically when Spring Boot uh, come, uh, come, came, so it was really, really easy. So I start with Spring Boot, which this was cool, Spring Boot was nice. And then, uh, so currently I'm trying really to use all the container technology with OpenShift and so on. And uh, we know that sometimes so yes, the performance is really, really important because of course Spring Boot was not really designed for uh, container stuff. And uh, the cool things that we have, especially to, with this project, it's about so Quarkus because it's really, really, really uh, a pleasure to, to, to work with that. So just especially on the developer part, because okay, if you are a Python, if you're a Python, uh, um, JavaScript uh, developer, it's something that for you, it's completely normal because uh, it's uh, interpretive uh, languages. But as a Java developer, so there is a developer mode who help you basically to change your code. And in real time, you will be able to see automatically what, uh, what's happening and to get the change, which means that you don't have to rebuild your application and to wait all the build your application. You just start with one command and you will be able to, to, to get the same experience that Java or Python or any other kind of language like this has. So which is really, 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 really cool and really, really awesome. Um, basically, yes, many Java, many, yes, uh, Quarkus, 
Uh, on the uh, also on the cloud native uh, part, um, I see and I use a lot of Golang. So yeah. because it's yeah, also yeah, yeah. quite uh, so it, it, it's all about also resources. Because of course, so Golang it's nice, so you can do really cool thing about resources. Uh, you know, you're not going to consume a lot of resources. But I start go when uh, I learn about um, operators. And for sure, so I don't know if anyone here uh, has some experience with Go, but to be able to really learn Go for me was really, really, really painful. Not the fact that to writing the code. Writing the code is okay. I mean, hey, so if you have a developer, any languages, you just need to understand how it's working. But after that, the main part of your job is to find the right library, the right languages that you have to use and so on. And I in Go, so I don't know if it's from my side. I don't know if I have some problem, you know, to, to type in Google to find things, but to be able to find the right libraries that I need to include into my, uh, to, to my uh, Go file, it was really, really painful. So hmm. basically there is some version you need to, so I, basically I need to go directly and to read code into some Git repository on the uh, P PKG um, uh, folder. So to read exactly what I need to do to find the right version, to play with all the Git branch, et cetera, et cetera. So on that part, so Go was cool, but it was quite, uh, yes, painful on that. Yeah. And, uh, but I don't know if anyone got uh, any, any experience on that my, part with Go. I mean, my experience with Go is very limited, right? Like I'm on, like I said, I'm an office guy, but uh, I have spoken at a GopherCon before, so I do have some Go experience, right? So uh, part of my job in, it was my last job in Raleigh before I moved up here to Detroit. I was working for uh, SolarWinds at the time and we had like, a lot of cruft, right? Like there was a lot of, cause we were acquired, we were a startup that we were acquired by SolarWinds. So we had a lot of technical debt. And part of that technical debt was like this one app that somebody had built like three years ago and just handed off to the company. Um, and it was like the stack of load balancers, a tiny bit of PHP code and a database, right? Like, so it was like, okay, there's a certificate expiring somewhere in this stack of load balancers in three days good luck right like and oh yeah by the way here's the standard that you have to adhere to with solar winds for you know passing verification and all that stuff so i actually wrote an ssl testing tool because the go standard library adheres to the rfc so well right like when it comes to uh like cryptography or anything like that that standard library inside go is very very good but like madhu pointed out you get outside of that standard library things get a little wonky with go that's about my experience too, is that it, it's because, I shouldn't say it this way, but like I, it's, I think that Go just hasn't reached the critical mindset yet that you have a billion of these external libraries, um, which is almost, it, it's gonna hit a sweet spot soon, but you look at Java right now and it's been around so long, it's been popular so long, there's a dozen different libraries to do the same thing. Python's starting to run into that too. I was just looking for, the hell was I just looking for? Um, completely forget which library I was looking for, but um, there's, oh, there's not the, just a Python's supposed to have just one single obvious way to do right, things, right? Right, that's, right. That's, that's, that's exactly the, right. Uh, you know, it's funny. They haven't so, succeeded yet. Um, it's, I'm going to go back to something else that would use it. So he, he talked about porting from WebSphere to WebLogic, and like that made me think back to like the old days of Java when it was the whole right one to run anywhere, and then right. enterprise Java took over, and it was no, it was so siloed. Python, um, there's definitely a variety of libraries out there that do similar things and trying to figure out what the best one. It was trying to connect to message buses. I was looking for anything, Rabbit, I was looking for AMQ Artemis, a bunch of different things I was playing with and trying to hunt them down was kind of annoying because there were a, few, a bunch and they all were kind of poorly documented. Um, Go is gonna hit that point soon with its kind of rise where it does have more of this and I just don't think it's there yet. Um, I go though, if we're not, not that we want to go into the bad stuff, but if we're talking about stacks that I didn't particularly care working with, it was absolutely go for me as much as I wanted to hmm. like it. Um, 
it ranged from everything from my own kind of tendencies to organize. Like I have a code directory in my room, in my home directory, and that's got all of my projects, except for Go, because they've got their own little way of separating things. You got to have your Go path and your source and your package. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then, um, oh, I, I can't. Uh, the other two oh, things gosh. I can't get past. I can't. Right, get past. Here we go. We got them started. I know. I know. The imports, <laughs> being, the imports being so heavily tied to the version control system has always bothered me. And then, what was it last year? Microsoft bought GitHub. Um, whenever yeah. they bought, right? Microsoft, right? I'm not completely yeah, yeah, this. yeah. Microsoft bought GitHub. Uh, and last then year, yeah. there was initially this this panic of oh shit, uh, there's going to be people who move off of it because they're anti Microsoft, but guess what? All of these Go imports say github.com slash mm -hmm. whatever. So what are we going to do about that? And then the error handling, I just have not been able to get comfortable with, nor their rationale for it. So I, it's a, it's all very personal things. You know, it's my, maybe if I was new to coding and that's what I first learned, all of this would feel a little more natural, but having come from a background in Java, a background in Python, having played with Ruby, having played with a couple of other things. Some of these things felt like change almost for the sake of change. And I know they would mm -hmm. argue differently. And especially, you know, it's hard saying any of this stuff on an open shift channel where Kubernetes is so die hard go. I came from OpenStack before this where I was like, yay, Python, everything. Um, but like the flip side is at the end of the day, bad code can be anywhere. Um, I knew a guy on OpenStack, he submitted a patch and he basically took this, this ability in Python to make an object reference callable. So he'd create a new object, whatever, and then call it like it was a method. There was no good reason to do this. It made the code look particularly weird because you lose a lot of readability in Python because you don't have the static types. So I'm looking at this, I'm like, why the hell is he calling this method on an object? Not like dot something, it was just like, you know, my variable parentheses. And I looked through the patch and I'm like, I'm like, I, that's cool that you could do it, but you kind of never should. Like there's, there's very few compelling reasons to do it. So my point, my point being, go, I'm watching chat right now blow up with Go modules and, and Go devs, and it's so funny. Just Go 111 modules alone as a variable name is enough to kind of piss me off. I mean, I just have this kind of weird mentality going into it. Um, point being, I think a lot of it is... Um, <laughs> I literally guys, just typed, I literally just typed, when it comes to Go, the newer versions are more friendly. And then you said that. <laughs> I just think, and I mean, it's, it's a personal thing. To me, that just looks particularly wonky, the Go 111 modules. Um, I, yeah, I get it. I get it. You know, I, uh, and I, I do like this, most of this quote, this, this beautiful is better than ugly, blah, blah, blah. The simple is better than complex is, is the thing like, most of the time, clever code, no matter what the stack, um, is fine when you're trying to show off and then everyone else is gonna hate it because the longer it takes me to parse through your particularly clever line of code, the, the more angry at you I'm going to be. And this is, again, a dude who's been doing this for 20 years and I'm so jaded going into all of this. So, you know, it's interesting to see as, as I, I see, I don't have the gray beard yet. And I'm not capable of growing it, but I, I get the appeal to that. Like, no, right. this is what I learned on. Stop changing this stuff for the sake of it. But, um, and I was going to be very good about not bringing this stuff up. I do have other complaints about going. Those are my, my, my major three. But So uh, I, I'm going to like try to diverge a little bit yes. here, maybe just to get you Go a little to off happy. topic, but like Red Monk releases, I think every six months, like a, a rankings, right? Like a programming language rankings and Go has historically been like towards the bottom of that list. I think for a lot of the reasons you mentioned, it's, uh, you know, it's widely used on backend systems. Uh, there is, you know, front end frameworks that work with it, but like, it's, it's unique. But like, I've never met a programming language that I picked up and learned before. So it's unique in good ways too. So it's, yeah. you know, like I would never have ever thought to write a line of Go code for that project if it weren't for like having experience in the Go community and stuff, right? And like, that was before going to GopherCon or anything like that, right? Like it was just being adjacent to Kubernetes and in part, you know, hanging out with, you know, all the Kubernetes devs, they all wrote Go. So, you know, 
What, what is this link? Is this popularity? So this is their rankings, right? Like, so they're an analyst firm. They, they do, you know, analyst type things. But Red Monk has traditionally been one of the more, I, I guess, fun or, you know, more, more accurate, more authentic uh, analyst firms, in my opinion. And, you know, we work, Red Hat works with them. Uh, we're, you know, one of their customers or whatever. And, but they've updated this so frequently, you can kind of get a good idea of where things are going, the direction of the industry, so forth, so on. But this is also based off like a lot of different metrics. And okay. they can go in, I think they go into that somewhere in here. But like they mentioned CSS, right? Like as a language. And it was never designed to be a language, right? <laughs> but here we are, you know. So um, I want to post it. And the reason I was asking for like clarification, like is it popularity? Is it favorite? Is it fun? This went around us, um, one of our mailing lists, um, yeah. not too, too long ago. And Rust ended up showing itself super popular in that yep. particular listing. Um, I've, yeah, I've recently picked up uh, and installed a Rust and I'm going to start uh, trying to kick tires on to be honest with you, Jason. I, I want to, I haven't yet, mostly because I'm like, all right, I've got too much other stuff I should be doing versus Same. the stuff that I'm like, all right, why, what am I ever going to do with Rust? But it's interesting when you look at it and so that particular I, uh, article. Linkerd proxy actually uses Rust now. So if you're doing anything service mesh related or proxy related, Linkerd is uh, picked up Rust. And that was, that yeah, that's, that was what my thing was, right? Like, all right, Rust, there's a lot of hype around it. There's a lot of talk around it. There seems to be a lot of growth around it. It has that go like community feel. So that means I should get involved usually. Uh, so <laughs> I was looking for projects and I was like, holy smokes, there's a CNCF endorsed project or, or not endorsed, but like CNCF project using Rust right now. And I was like, well, I should just help these folks, right? <laughs> like it's part of day job, right? Like ta-da yeah. and so yeah that's kind of how i was gonna go about doing that it's interesting it's interesting because especially when you look at the second one that i linked where i was talking about i, I like the phrasing on it it was percent of developers who are developing with the language or technology and have expressed interest in continuing to develop it like that's very much a pro popularity mm -hmm. test but it goes to say you know people when i first learned python people were like it's fun to program in and like i was like i don't really know what that means but you start doing it and there are certain things that feel right, that feel nice. And there's certain things that you can abuse and feel wrong. Like at school, we talked about, should we, we, we teach Java to our freshmen. Um, we teach, I'm sorry, let's do it this way. We teach algorithms and data structures using Java to our freshmen. Like we don't specifically teach you Java for your comp sci degree. Um, and we talked about using Python. And I'm like, that's gonna be a headache because you can make, you can be accidentally correct with Python so much that I think it, it kind of hinders learning. Um, but I see in here, Kotlin, Madhu, have you seen anybody actually using Kotlin? No. Okay. No, <laughs> I never met any, so far, any customers, but uh, yes, it's because also, I, I mean- I mean, it's new, right? I'm not, yes, yes, but also I'm not, um, uh, I'm not uh, objective on that. So it's always about, uh, you know, feeling affinity when we talk about Java and uh, basically a lot of people know me as a Java, uh, yes, as a Java developers. Because yes, it, it, it's too bad because I know in my team, there is some people who really like, um, so JavaScript and maybe they got some experience with Kotlin, but uh, unfortunately, yes, I don't have this. Uh, I haven't seen yet. So anyone using Kotlin and uh, yes, playing with that. I used Kotlin uh, while uh, developing in uh, Android. Uh, and it was much uh, easier. Uh, I mean, if you are Android developer, uh, you use Java basically, and then the byte can get converted. So you basically use Java. Um, but then it came Kotlin support, which was much, much better in terms of uh, code. So if you like uh, this new uh, programming way, if you like a fun functional way, if you and you want to stay typed, you don't want to have, uh, uh, you know, uh, ambiguous type. I think Kotlin, it's a good option. Uh, I don't know, outside the, the Android world, I know there is also a Kotlin for Quarkus, 
uh, which is pretty exciting, but it is in preview mode. So I don't know, uh, Kotlin outside Android, how it worked out, but the programming language itself, uh, uh, it's cool. Uh, but we know that we need, we, we, today we talked about framework, how those framework uh, makes our life easier. And yeah. I don't, at the moment, I don't think Kotlin has lots of framework for non-Android developing. Fair, but isn't it fair a, a lot of Kotlin's appeal that it runs on the JVM so you can, in theory, use all of the Java ecosystem, or does it not actually pan out that way? Yeah, uh, if you remember, there was a Scala uh, uh, was uh, having a was great bring that momentum. Up too, yeah. yeah, great momentum now disappeared because uh, uh, anyone doesn't want uh, any more Scala. Uh, so it depends uh, on the moment also. But those JVM-based uh, languages, I think they are powerful because you uh, the uh, um, you have the let's say stability or uh, the strongness of the JVM, which is a uh, pretty solid on the IT market, uh, more than 20 years. Uh, and you can uh, uh, program in such uh, languages if you don't like the classical uh, Java, which by the way is uh, also updating itself to become more functional uh, day by day, but it is not for sure JavaScript or on a other kind of interpreter code. I, I would I would clarify that say year by year instead of day by day. It's been taking their sweet ass time getting real functional into there. Partially because yeah. Scala yeah. gave them a really good Decade amount of time by to deal with it. Um, Closure is another one that was a Lisp syntax written on top of the JVM, and I'm fascinated at that concept. Yeah. But you know, we got into a situation on a project many many years ago at Red Hat where we had one QA guy who loved Closure, and he wrote a whole bunch of automation in it. He was the only one who knew closure and wanted to know closure. So now we suddenly had all of this QA automation that either only one person could maintain or no one else wanted to bother. Um, but I, I'm glad you mentioned Scala because I like, that was a big shift for me when I started to realize that functional programming is so infinitely easier to test. And that was really before I had to take into account things like scalability, cloud native, things like that, where it's even better, where I'm not worrying about all of this state transition and things like that. Um, but I'm glad you mentioned that though, because that's, I was thinking the same thing. It kind of went away. I liked what it was doing though with trying to bring functional, um, but there's been, there's been so many of them. And then Kotlin, like you said, it's kind of the flavor of the month, the, the side flavor of the month for Java, but whereas Java right. is, like, is the vanilla. Um, so it, it, Ballerina came up in chat. Um, I've so seen hang on just a second. I wanted to make a yeah. programming note. Uh, so due to uh, power outages, uh, we're not going to have our OpenShift Commons briefing today. So both uh, the host and speaker are having power issues, it looks like. So just a heads up there, we can run long if we want to. So, okay. you know, Ryan, we can have all the fun we want. Uh. <laughs> down a nerd, nerd rabbit hole here. So, I mean, yeah. Ballerina is kind of the first step toward a, a deep rabbit hole here. Um, they have a massive presence at KubeCon. Like they have this gigantic booth and it's it's always like one of the larger ones. And every time I look into it, it really, I, and I get where they're going. The fact that, you know, modern programming is a lot of just gluing libraries together and to do what you want to do. And I was trying to explain this to my students. I'm like, don't be surprised that you do a whole ton of research and then you write three lines of code and it does something because it's all about kind of learning these and chaining these services together. And I know that um, Ballerina is attempting to expedite that, but that is the extent of me looking into it. I think like three, four years ago when I started attending KubeCon, I was like, oh, this is gonna be a big deal. And then it never really gained any traction. So yeah, they, they kind of showed off. So the, the Ballerina team years ago before I even worked at Red Hat, uh... It was after I started my newsletter. So they showed off the ballerina to me and I was like, this is great, but like, I don't see any advantages over like any other language right now. Right. So what's the appeal in learning? And like, they didn't have an answer and I'm not sure if they do still. Right. Like there's, there's much bigger communities. There's much, I mean, I'm not to bag on them or anything, but like starting a new language is hard. Right. Uh, and, and I understand what they were trying to do, right. Like make this, concept easier but i don't think they went the right way with it if that makes sense right like gluing together services should be 
as simple as like taking glue and paper, right? Not necessarily gluing code together, right? If that makes sense. No, it isn't. All that stuff ends up being so prototypey. And like, right. it's cool to be able to say, oh, I did this in a handful of lines of code and it came up super fast. But like anything sustainable, you, you know, you start breaking away from a lot of that kind of stuff. And one of the things I like about this dev advocate role is I don't have to think past the initial fast prototype and demo. Like I haven't productized code in years <laughs> and I'm getting really sloppy for it, but it's kind of awesome. Right? <laughs> you see it in Ryan's face to put you back like, in prod, yeah. <laughs> you totally do. I would be <laughs> so bad. So I don't know how to do any real code anymore. I just, <laughs> I just do demos. <laughs> right? Like. I was just recently doing something where I was scaling um, an app connected to a database. And I was like, oh shit, I've got a transactional race condition here. I'm like, how do we fix those these days? I'm like, what are the tools? I'm like, I kind of don't care. I'm just going to get past my demo and not have to worry about it. Like all of the hard stuff I kind of get to avoid right now. And then just focus on the cool flashy stuff for demos. And like, I've, I, yeah. I knew life one isn't, guy who- Life isn't demo development though, sadly. No, it's yeah. not. <laughs> I, don't, I don't envy those people anymore. Like I knew one guy who's a developer advocate. He wants to go back. Like he sees his career migrating back toward dev as he leans toward retirement, just sitting in a corner. Like, I don't know that I could do that. Having to focus on one single thing and do it correctly. Like, nah, let me just play around with a whole bunch of shit poorly and then move I, on. I, I'm, I'm interested to see how my career goes as I age. Cause I, see, I saw myself getting off the pager. <laughs> You know, that's a high priority. I don't ever see myself wanting to get back on the pager, right? Like, if that makes sense. So to kind no, of carry, carry the code, right? Like, I don't necessarily want to have that responsibility, if that makes sense. That's, I was going to say it'd be an interesting topic for the stream, but I don't know if that's kind of dirty laundry we want to air. But I would really like for, like, our two teams to be talking about the stuff that we don't miss or the stuff that we can appreciate was, was tough earlier in our careers. And you know, you kind of got to have that 2 a.m. pager call. I didn't, you did as the ops guy. I had yeah. the, you know, transactioning and, and the guy who would get commit and push on a Friday afternoon and then go on vacation <laughs> for a week. Um, but like some of that stuff, like, and we're off topic now, but like, woof, I can play with the fun stacks. I guess to bring it back to topic. I'm like, well, yeah, I mean, I'm going to class today. This next project, yeah, why not? Let's just do it in Ruby because it'll look cooler on a slide when I say this container's running in Ruby. Do I write nice. good Ruby code? No, God, no. But it looks cool on the slide. So that's fine. Right. Yeah. No, we do have a uh, starting, I think it's this. It's next week, uh, an open shift administrator's office hours. So it's similar to this, but it's for like the ops and admin track. It's starting uh, the 14th. I'm look, my calendar, my whole computer is just being really slow right now for some reason. So uh, it's definitely next week. It's definitely at a time I forgot. So, but stay tuned. Ah, got it. Uh, 11 a.m. on Wednesdays, 11 a.m. Eastern on Wednesdays, 1500 UTC, the open shift administrator's office hour. So yeah, come with your ops admin questions. Is that basically just your team or are you pulling anyone else for that? Uh, uh, I mean, we'll pull in some folks here and there. Yeah. I mean, if you want to join in, reach out to Andrew. He's got the, the programming lead on that one right now. He, he did a whole series of blog posts that he's just basically turning, just cranking into shows. So like having you look at that list and interject that might be a good idea so yeah reach out to andrew on that one for sure cool i had a follow-up for madhu on madhu you said you mentioned uh spring boot uh development and i was curious if you had like a five minute uh explanation on what was the big innovation with spring boot was it just far faster startup times or is there is there other uh, advantages. I'm a little bit in the dark uh, as far as Java ecosystem. And then also from Spring Boot to Quarkus, are there major technical uh, benefits uh, on those two transitionary kind of steps? Yeah. Um, so uh, basically, uh, what we have with uh, Quarkus, uh, Quarkus was really designed to be able to run as a container. So everything that we run about cloud native stuff. So we know that we want to, uh, to for example, to expose and to develop services. So microservices or whatever, but services with some REST API for most of them, et cetera. So basically uh, to be able to just expose one services with uh, one services, uh, just to expose and to create one services. So you are going to write less line of code 
that you have to do with Spring Boot. Because with Spring Boot, you need to create first a Spring application classes. From the Spring application, you need to create uh, other class for your resources. If you add some database, so you have to create another, uh, another uh, interface. Basically, you have to create a class based on interface to be able to create stuff. So basically, the first improvement that we have between Spring Boot and Quarkus is uh, to be able to write less code in order to get the same result. Um, so saying that, of course, it's uh, exactly uh, about the discussion that we talk about uh, Java with, uh, with Go or with Python or JavaScript, etc. is the fact that Java uh, and Spring Boot was there uh, first, which means that uh, the, all the libraries and all the ecosystem that Spring Boot has is a bit better than what we have with Quarkus, but we need to just uh, keep in mind that Quarkus just have one year and a half, something like that as a project. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. it's very, very, very recent. So, and uh, we try to, yes, to add more and more libraries, basically libraries and all the ecosystem to be able to interact with a lot of uh, current product on this. Uh, the cool things, and for me, what is uh, really important, so as a developer, so it's not about, let's say, the startup time or uh, to consume less resources, even if it's really, really important when you go in production, in the cloud native stuff, and for guys like you, for example, Chris, who come from the ops for mm -hmm. them, so it's really, really important. But as a developer, it's really about this uh, dev mode in which that I don't have to build anymore uh, my, uh, my, uh, my binary, my jar file in order to test it. So I just do it once as uh, so the demo that doing uh, basically with Maven, uh, Maven, uh, Quarkus, uh, colon dev. And then after that, I just have to, yes, to code. And then I check directly what's happening. And for me, this is, let's say, what I really like that is the fact that of course I would be more, more, more productive. But uh, you know, sometimes when you have to, uh, you 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 write something, you change something, uh, just uh, part of the code. Then you have to build. So you wait one minute for build to finish. Then you have to start uh, your service. So you wait again one minute. So uh, you can do it like this. But uh, the fact that you don't want to do that and to be more productive, so you write a lot of code, a lot of things in once. You don't test anything. You just code, 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 code. And maybe at the end of the morning, you just say, okay, let's build it and let's check it. If everything is okay, and I'm sure that everybody out there doing really nice and beautiful working codes at the first time, so it's okay. But when you have any problem, if you have to debug everything that you write during the morning, so you are going to consume your time with that. So it's what I call the little uh, waterfall of the developer. And it's something that Quarkus really break. So for Java developer, only for Java developer, if you are, I mentioned, yes, Python, JavaScript, for you, it's completely normal. So it's a normal life. But for a Java developer, it's really a big, big, big uh, advantage and a big, big benefit that we have with uh, the Quarkus framework. That was so cool. When I first saw that, um... I feel like the first time I really played with it was code one last year. So actually about a year ago at this point, back when we used to travel. Um, and I watched just a booth demo of Quarkus and seeing that hot reload, I was, it was kind of crazy because I never would have thought Java would get there. Like that's yeah. not a Java thing to do. And it's one of those ones I had started with Python and saw Flask and then and picking up the, the, uh, the hot redeploy, same thing with JavaScript, like React and things like that. Um, seeing Java get to that point is really, really cool. Um, and I totally see what you're saying because you end up getting these bad practices. Um, you know, a slightly different story, but on OpenStack, we had this battery of unit test that took about 80 minutes to run. Um, so I got into these, these kind of Hail Marys where I type a whole bunch of stuff, pray to God, run it. And then, you know, you fail at 78 minutes in and you just want to throw something out the window because it's just like some kind of typo or something. And this wasn't even Java, this was Python. So I, I'm certainly not faulting the language there. It's definitely our setup for it. But you're right, that longer, for whatever reason, between typing and actually seeing it running is, is huge. And seeing the hot yeah. is really bonkers. 
I mean, this is why, like, I build all my websites using a tool like Hugo or something like that, where it's like, uh, you know, I get that instant feedback. I don't have to go out somewhere else to do testing. I can do it all locally. You know, it, it's that that live reload. Uh, Narendra was talking a lot about that in chat. He's curious what other languages have kind of that dynamic loading capability other than like JS. And, so, know, I mean, it kind of depends on um, the framework and the language. So things like Python and JavaScript lend themselves very, very easily to it without needing this compilation stuff. If you've ever built anything in Maven, it's um, intimidating. And I don't <laughs> really mean that as a knock, but I mean, like I had bad issues in Maven years and years and years ago where it would yeah. corrupt things. Now it's fine, but intimidating in the sense that you do a checkout and you run that first Maven and it downloads and it just goes just ape shit. And you see all these URLs and they're flying across the screen. I mean, NPM is not that far different from it, but for some reason, um, Maven feels a little bit heavier. Um, but um, who the hell is I going with this? Oh, uh, languages. So at the end of the day though, the framework still has to support it too. So if you're not running Flask, for instance, if you don't run it in dev mode, you don't get that. And there's a dozen different ways to put it in dev mode. It's an environment variable, or you can directly hard code it in, or you can do different configurations if you're dev, product QA, whatever. Um, your framework's got to support it. So language-wise, I'm sure Ruby on Rails has some kind of option at this point. I know React does, I'm sure. Um, just straight Node.js development does. Um, Flask does, I think Django does at this point. Um, and then Quarkus though, Java is a lot more rare there. So I think you're almost at the point of, it's more rare to see a place that doesn't support it or a framework that doesn't support it than that does the exception of Java where Quarkus, that's really one of the more awesome selling points for it. So I was thinking for... maybe, maybe in the future, to, sorry, sorry to interrupt. I was thinking maybe in the future to avoid those uh, flooding of dependencies uh, like in Maven or, or Node.js, um, dependencies can be shared as a uh, container layer, right? So if you have already the same layer, you don't have to download the word, word like uh, uh, all the thousands of jars of the Maven dependency of Gradle or Node.js. So if we share the same layer as containers does, maybe we can have dependencies more optimized. This can be an agnostic way to solve this uh, software dependencies issue in the container way, maybe. Yeah. yeah, makes sense. Cool. I mentioned a couple kind of interpreted languages that, that I've been very comfortable with uh, in, in chat here. PHP, Ruby, JavaScript, and, and Python as well. Uh, I know Python will compile to bytecode, but, but it, it performs pretty interpreted, like an interpreted language. Um, those are all, I think, I can get a lot of fast feedback out of those uh, develop language runtimes. And so I lean towards using those as, as a means of getting productivity because I need to see feedback while I'm working, right? And so mm -hmm. I've kind of avoided Java for that reason, but hearing more about Quarkus and dev mode and you know all of those ways of uh, getting quicker feedback with compiled code uh, or out of a compiled language um, is really compelling, especially if you have a lot of uh, business value around specific uh, library dependencies. Like you really need some Java library dependencies. Great, keep using it as long as you can maintain that fast feedback loop, uh, ideally. Um, part of what I want to do better about on this channel is demoing how you would achieve that faster feedback loop with languages that ought to do a great job like Node.js. Um, because if I have Node.js running just via Nodemon, uh, someone mentioned using Nodemon to restart your yes. Node.js server. That's a decent way to reboot the whole server. Um, but there might be smaller pieces that you could reload more easily um, or, or have like a like usually what I do is have a like a production mode that doesn't do any hot reloading and then a dev mode that's like a slightly modified stack that will watch the disk and anytime there's changes reload just that one web service or recompile the CSS or uh, 
minify the uh, tar balls or I don't know, what, whatever I need to do redone, mm -hmm. it redoes that one small piece instead of redoing a full build um, like I'd get through a CI system or, you know, what, not, not the full, full test suite, right? I will say that's right. one thing I missed about a compiled language is just that initial sanity check that I didn't mistype anything. And the amount of times I've written <laughs> things in Python that like live in an if statement that you're fine, oh, you're man. fine. And then all of a sudden it just completely shits the bed. And you're like, boom. Mm, yeah. That's, I would have liked to compile it and say, hey, stupid, don't do that. <laughs> yeah. Is, is linting part of your stack? You know, like I think. It yeah. Should be. Right. Like that, that should just... be somehow built into your repo to say, lint the code, enforce two spaces indentation. That's the only way to indent. Right. Look, earlier when I was talking Absolutely. about the fact that I don't write production level code, <laughs> do you really think I lint my demo projects that I'm like, oh shit, I got to talk tomorrow. Type, 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 type. So when I built that uh, SSL tester tool, yeah, no, I did not do any linting or anything like that. And it started out as 37 lines of code and it did, you know, exactly what I wanted it to do. And then I realized, right, like, there's all these use cases where people would expect certain behavior. I should probably accommodate that. And then and the, it's just the lines of code grew, you know? So, it's funny because yeah. like that I keep talking about that because I keep, I'm actually trying to write a series of articles right now about like kind of real development practices on containers instead of just hello world and right. container, like what happens when you have a bigger app you're trying to piece together. And that's what I'm, really interested in showing like, okay, let's see what it looks like in your IDE. And let's see what it looks like when you're using Odo at a command line or something like that. And that's where I particularly noticed, I'm like, God, my processes, these are such crap because like, <laughs> I'd already unit test. I'm like, oh God, how do we start again? Um, and it's kind of nice, I'm not gonna lie. Yeah, you've got to, uh, you've got to add like your own CI CD pipeline at times. For sure. And that's uh, exactly, but I need to like add it while I'm doing development. And the problem is I'm like, okay, I'm going to write it and then I'm going to cram it into pipelines and then do a talk on pipelines, but I've never, right. I'm not natively using them at the time and seeing something like I've, I haven't pitched this to my team, but like we really, I'd love for us to be working on a big project where we kind of step on each other's toes again and someone breaks the build and all of these things that we've all been able to avoid like it would not be a bad idea for us to feel those exact points of working inside of OpenShift. It's just nobody's exactly got the time for it. Right. You, you are so. inventing a new programming model from test-driven development to pipeline-driven development. So first you, you write the pipeline, then you code, then you, you change it step-by-step. Uh, step. Yeah, that's cool. It, it would make a cool talk. I saw, this is forever ago too, 15 plus years ago, a test-driven development talk where he, um, was talking about building a, a game for like a, a system for, for scoring bowling. And um, he's like, the first thing we do is write a test case. And I'm like, we were all like young too. We were in our early twenties. So we were cocky and didn't, we believe in tests and shit like that. We're like, no dumbass, you don't even have a constructor yet. And he's like, and that's the first test is we try to instantiate <laughs> the object and we watch the <laughs> test fail and then we fix it. And there was a couple of us are like, eh, okay. <laughs> And we all tried to over engineer the shit out of it. And he's just like, his whole process was write the test, see it fail, write the code to fix it. And it's not applicable in all cases. It's never been something I've really bought into, but the talk was very interesting because so much of my argument was like, well, wait, don't put that code there because you're gonna have to move it later. And he's like, then I'll move it when I need to move it. I'm like, you're right, but I don't like you for that. <laughs> <laughs> you're right but it's like like that meme that's is just funny. like fine that's hilarious so and it was an interest like i said i i took some principles out of it i've never gone like a full tdd type of style but it, it definitely put a new train of thought on the idea of um over engineering or you're not going to need it and all of those types of things that you know you see written and they, they make for like you know bullet lists and stuff like that but seeing the way that panned out there i'm like all right, I'll come with you on this journey. This was kind of cool. Nice. Cool.
Ryan, anything else you want to share today? I mean, uh, this is a good no. conversation. We yeah, had, right? yeah. Like, I, this is great. Thank you all for uh, contributing. And um, it, thank you to Naren Dev in chat as, as well for keeping the chat going. Yeah, um, yeah. Love you, Naren Dev. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we are back every week at uh, this time. So join us anytime. We'd uh, love to hear your feedback. Um, I think next week, Serena is going to be back with uh, Mohit from uh, our engineering department. Yes. We're going to be um, talking about CRC WebView, which ooh, nice. I don't even know what that is. So like, that'll be exciting for me. And, yeah. you know, it's Serena. So like, it's a talk from the future. So that's uh -huh. always good too, right? So yeah. So yeah, join us next week for sure. Same bad time, same bad channel, 11 Eastern, uh, 1500 UTC. And yeah, that's that's the best way to get a hold of the dev experts here on OpenShift TV and they will get you what you need. If you have questions, please bring them next week and we'll get them answered for you. Uh, Narendra had a bunch of questions for me apparently the, this weekend in the CNCF Slack and it involves regex. So I'm sure I'm tapping one of y'all. Um, so <laughs> not, not that I'm bad at regex, it's just I don't trust myself at it. You're so like I'm everyone else. You do it infrequently right. enough where you don't, you have to Google the syntax and then yes. you're like, yep, I got all this. Well, and it's not necessarily the syntax. It's like, does it actually get all the use cases or yeah. is it too expansive? Is it limited enough? Or is it too expansive, right? Like that's always my problem. Uh, but remember, uh, so yeah, later today or you know, right after this, we were supposed to have the OpenShift Commons briefing. I'm very sorry that's not available today due to a power outage. Um, that's life. You know, it's storming here. We're lucky that we didn't lose power here today. So uh, I have battery backup. So uh, yeah. So tomorrow on the channel, zero nine hundred Eastern Time, thirteen hundred UTC, the level up hour with the one and only Langdon White followed by another OpenShift Commons briefing, uh, transactions and Kubernetes and OpenShift with Spencer Kimball from Cockroach Labs. So that'll be super, super fun. Narendev has a question for Jason. Hang on. Go ahead, Narendev. BDD, I have not. Um, done BDD. I don't even know a ton Behavior-driven development? Is yeah. That what that is? Like yeah. Concept, yeah. Based on functional testing expectations, right? You would, uh, you'd spec out, this is okay. what the service should do externally. Mm. Um, let me use curl to, I don't know. I, I think that's what uh, part yeah, of what we curl until do. it works. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I, I like it from a, a contract standpoint. If you know you have other things relying on you, I think that's a really smart approach. Um, it's just, you know, I think I've established in the past hour that my practices days are shit. So um, we need, uh, definitely we need to work not on that. I, <laughs> do I? I mean, as long as I can keep this job, I can keep writing crappy demo applications that don't crash when I'm on stage and then I could just abandon it. So I mean, um, there may be a point where I got to get those chops back in me, but for now. Everyone's building pipelines these days, man. I'm just saying. I know. Like I said, I'm, I'm, I have started down that route. I just. Uh, okay, good. It's, Good. It's that, that warms my heart. Yes. My little DevOps heart. <laughs> All right. Madhu, Jason, Natali, Ryan, thank you so much for joining me today. They're joining us today. Everybody, you know, uh, as always, tune in to openshift.tv uh, for the latest and greatest. We do have a new show starting this week, uh, as a matter of fact. Um, it's called In the Clouds with Red Hat Leadership. And Joe Fernandez is going to be my first guest. I'll be interviewing people from Ooh. Red Hat Leadership. So if you're not familiar with me, my speaking style, my interviewing style, head on over to devopsish.com or chrisshort.net. You can kind of see that like I don't pull any punches with anybody, right? So uh, I hope Red Hat Leadership knows what they're getting themselves into. Uh, I promise not to throw you too hard of a curveball, but there's going to be curveballs, so be ready. Um, and hopefully none of them are watching, so they won't know what's coming even better um so yeah uh tune in for that that's on uh thursdays uh it'll be i think we set it up for monthly uh, double checking uh repeat i didn't set that up for this event anyways brilliant uh so yeah tune in for that on thursday and by then i will know the frequency of it i believe it's every two weeks yes um so yeah, that is Thursday at 11 a.m. Eastern, 1500 UTC. So when in doubt, subscribe to the calendar and the link is in chat. And thank you all for tuning in and I'll see you all soon. See you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.